And this afternoon, we've assembled a youth panel, lots of big stories affecting young people today. Uh, we've just been talking about A-levels. We know we're going to get uh, vaccines rolled out to 16 and 17 year olds. Lots of pressure on university places, COVID passports for nightclubs. And joining us to talk through those and many other issues are Georgia Gilhooly, who's just turned 23 and is a freelance journalist and a Young Voices contributor. Hello, Georgia. Georgia. It's great to be here. How are you? Uh, very well. Thanks very much indeed for coming on the programme. Also with us is Jason Reed, 21 year old writer and commentator. Jason, hello. Hi, Carol. Great to be with you. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, Georgia, let's just start with A levels. Uh, lots of students will be anxiously awaiting results on Tuesday. It's a tense enough time in any case. And there's already a lot of concern about the results, whether there's going to be grade inflation and whether this is going to in some way undermine the some extraordinary achievements from a lot of students. Mm -hmm, absolutely. I mean, the first thing is, I suppose it can't be worse than last year for the students when we had all those new terms pretty much on the day, people getting grades based on a postcode lottery. Um, discriminating against, obviously. Georgia, um, I'm sorry. Georgia, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, your line is not sounding great. We're very keen to um, hear you. So just uh, we'll we'll get back to you and get you on a line where we can hear what you're saying much more clearly. Um, Jason Reed, let me ask you about that. Uh, we're seeing lots of predictions of l another record year for high results, but that won't necessarily. Um, be a good thing for the students themselves who've probably worked very hard? No, absolutely. What we don't want to see is a repeat of uh, of last year where um, students, as you say, their achievements and all the effort they've put in was undermined because of the uh, haphazard grading system. Of course, the problem last year was that it was based on this algorithm, which we heard a lot about, uh, which, as Georgia mentioned, uh, there was the postcode lottery element um, the fact that a lot of the data going into the algorithm was based on uh, what past cohorts at your same school had achieved. And so a lot of students felt that they were treated unfairly. Uh, this time, it does seem like the system uh, at first glance is a little bit better thought through because it places a lot of the burden more on teachers. And they can, of course, use resources like mock exam results and coursework and things like that to determine uh, students' grades. But because they are uh, done in, being done in this unconventional way, there's a real risk of grade inflation. And we will have to wait a few years to see just how that plays out. But there's a very real risk that this entire generation, this entire cohort of students might see that their their A-level results count for less than they would have done in any other year, which was, is a real shame because they haven't worked any less hard towards those qualifications. No, and it's probably been even tougher because many of them have had their education disrupted and so on. As we were hearing earlier in the programme, though, it should be better this year than last year. We know there's not going to be an algorithm and we know that we have got these um, fixed criteria which teachers will be working to to try to ensure that there is fairness across the system. Yeah, exactly. There are all, all sorts of uh, checks and balances in place. So it shouldn't, in theory, shouldn't be a, a replication of last year's disaster. That would be quite an achievement if the government managed to do that. Um, but at the same time, there are, of course, some, some really serious problems. It's very far from ideal. I certainly wouldn't want to be a teacher at the moment. Um, having all this pressure on your shoulders, trying to make the right and the fair decisions, um, because these teachers effectively, because they get to decide uh, the grades for their for their students, they have their students' lives and their careers in their hands. Um, it's a huge amount of pressure to have, and there's no right way to do it. Um, and there's the potential that the whole system could become quite messy as well later on in the year with the appeals process in particular. And we'll have to see how it plays out. But of course, there's an appeals process ordinarily anyway. But if you've got a certain grade in an exam, there's not a huge amount that can be done to change that. Whereas when it's um, when it's less solid than that, when it's based on um, criteria that aren't as inflexible as an exam result, uh, it could become quite messy and it can become quite difficult when it comes to 
university admissions for students as well, which of course are incredibly important. Yeah, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Georgia Gilholly um, now back with us. Um, just first of all, do you share those concerns that uh, teachers are now providing the marks for the A-level results that we'll get on Tuesday? Um, another set of record high grades uh, might not pan out very well for some students who've worked incredibly hard and perhaps done extremely well. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. I mean, sort of the rule, the basic rule of supply and demand, if, if, um, you know, something inflates, it's worth less value. I mean, it almost reminds me of a Mitchell and Webb sketch from about a decade ago about A-level grades. And it's like, um, the character says something like, well, you know, if everyone gets A's, well, I don't know, we'll just use the posh kids because they're expected to go to university anyway. Um, Not quite what happens, obviously, but sort of speaks to that issue. Um, And yeah, I mean, teachers, obviously, they're professionals, they know their subject, but I think it's better to have external examiners be reviewing exams and uh, coursework because even though many of them are teachers themselves, if you're having a situation where it's the teachers at at your school who are choosing your grades, um, it really opens the door... I guess, to favouritism, discrimination. Um, That's certainly something I would be worried about if I was in that situation now. Um, And yeah, it's just, you know, it's not, it's not the path to um, having a rigorous exams process. We know that. Uh, We know already without these issues, um, exam grades have been massively inflated over the past uh, few decades. And it's not, I think we all know, I think we were all teenagers once, it's not because teenagers are magically getting cleverer it's because things are becoming more lax um, and that's not not a good thing in general for um, students because uh, they're there to learn. It's particularly tough for this cohort of students though, isn't it, who've had their education massively disrupted because of the pandemic. Uh, Many of them have worked very hard and some of them will find that they've got really good grades but then can't get into the university or onto the course that they want. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to be seeing that situation probably more so with inflation, though, because I think that, you know, if we're going to give everyone top grades because we feel sorry for them because they haven't necessarily had the usual school experience, which I massively sympathise with, I think that the government has betrayed young people on this count. I think that that doesn't solve the issue. You know, giving everyone an A doesn't mean that everyone's going to go to Cambridge or Oxford or UCL or wherever. Um, It means that they're going to have to look at other ways of choosing people because they have limited resources for example there was a report earlier this week about possible entrance exams um, after results day which is going to be putting an incredible amount of pressure on young people Um, but unfortunately it kind of makes sense I mean they need to somehow choose who is going to make the cut and the exams and the process right now clearly isn't doing that. Yeah, Jason, what do you think of that idea of uh, some universities, particularly those that uh, are finding themselves absolutely swamped with um, students who want to come and have probably got the right grades, saying, well, we're going to have to set our own entrance exams? Well, universities are in a very difficult position as well, aren't they? Because they've got to make all their usual decisions, which are hard enough anyway, and they've got to do them without the usual uh, reliable, unshakable grades system that they usually have to rely on. Of course, the exam system isn't perfect, but the reason we keep using it, the big advantage of it, is that it creates a level playing field. You know when you take your A-levels, when you sit those exams, that every other 18-year-old in the country is sitting exactly the same exams in that subject. Um, And so what we've lost in these last two years is that uniformity of the system, where we know that everyone is uh, being judged in exactly the same way. Because when you rely on any other measure, whether it's an algorithm or teacher decisions or any other criteria it might be, there are all kinds of other factors that can come into play and can uh, obfuscate those uh, those results that the students get, which are all important. And so it leaves the universities in an impossible position. Uh, I mean, the hope is that for students who do uh, get into university this autumn, that they'll have a rather better experience than those who did so a year ago. Um, But we're still hearing that quite a few are going to be uh, introducing or continuing with blended learning. Some of the uh, the teaching and some of the uh, seminars and so on will be online. There won't be the same amount of face-to-face tuition and the same kind of interaction. Georgia, is that a problem, do you think? 
Yes, absolutely. I mean, my younger brother is about to be in that situation. He just finished his uh, A-levels, is waiting for his grades. Um, and I think back to my own experience a few years ago in university thinking, you know, if I had to stay in my room or whatever um, for most of it, because I could not go to seminars, lectures or social events, you know, I, I met some of my closest friends um, by chance through those kind of meetings. I'm sure most people um, re- can report on the same thing in, in their um, personal life. and. I just think it's very sad because we're just completely stunting the university experience. Um, And even not just on a social level, it's also about the learning, you know, in an art subject, especially it's about discussion. It's about those in-person interactions in STEM subjects, um, you know, lab work, that kind of thing that obviously needs to happen outside of your bedroom. (laughs) Um, And I think, you know, they're going to be paying the exact same amount of money, they're going to be in the exact same amount of debt, but they're just not getting the same experience. Uh, They're being ripped off, frankly. Jason, would you agree with that? Do you think some university students are being ripped off, particularly perhaps some who've been at university over the last year, who've had to pay a fortune for accommodation and half the time they couldn't even go there and an awful lot of their learning has been um, sitting in front of a laptop? Yeah, it's a real shame to have the university experience compromised like that. I graduated from university just a few weeks ago, and so I had a year and a bit of my uh, of my time at university was compromised in exactly this way. And the reason that it's even more frustrating for students who are starting out now at university, those 18-year-olds, is because it seems unnecessary. Most of the population is vaccinated. Vaccines have been you know, open to 18-year-olds for some time now. It really doesn't seem like there's any reason to continue being so cautious that we're willing to uh, let the standards of education um, and the, the type of education that we're giving to our students fall so dramatically for yet another year. It, it just seems unnecessary. And I can imagine being incredibly frustrated if I was an 18 year old now, especially because over the last couple of years, young people have made such incredible sacrifices, um, even when it's a novel virus that doesn't really affect them in the same way that it does older people if uh, there'll be a lot of people who were 16 years old when uh, when the pandemic started early last year and are now 18 and ready to go to university and that's supposed to be a very important a very formative period within your life but they've they've had their lives on pause for so long now and it feels very unfair on them to keep that going even after they start university yeah and we'll talk a little bit more about that um a little bit later but just tell us first of all you so you've just um graduated from university what what were you doing and what was this past year or so like um so i studied sociology at the lsc in london um it was a very dramatic change in march of last year it feels like two different university experiences I had, because when you're doing Zoom lectures and Zoom classes, it's just it's just not the same. You um, you lose those connections that you have with your classmates uh, that you see used to see every week or multiple times a week. You lose those connections with your teachers and with your lecturers. Um, and of course, you can't use any of the campus resources. You can't go to the library um, because everything was shut down for so many months. Um, and it just means that the university experience isn't the same, both in an educational or in a, in a social um, way. It, it's a completely different experience. It, it felt like doing some kind of online training course in the evenings rather than being a full-time student. I, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. Yeah, I mean, Georgia, that's that's just not what you go to university for, is it? No, no, absolutely. Jason's completely right. I'm just glad that... Um it didn't happen to me um, in my undergrad years, which is certainly more formative, though I did end up, you know, I started doing my master's at the start of the pandemic. And once it hit, I sort of decided, OK, I'm putting this on pause because, you know, I was studying medieval history. It's very much about the source work and sort of debates with your classmates and things. I was thinking, you know, I'm not going to spend my money um, on this. Um, I'm going to put it on pause until I can have the experience that it was supposed to be. And are you confident that you will be able to get back to it? Or or are you now going to end up thinking that perhaps it's not what you're going to do after all? No, no, absolutely. Um, Probably if I do go back, it will be a different subject. Um, But that's more just because I've come sort of a different path in my career since then. But um, I certainly won't be going back um, before things are restored to, I guess, quote unquote, normality, because I just don't think it's worth my time and my money, of course, to be putting myself in that situation. Uh, fascinating to hear from you both. I know you're going to stay uh, with us throughout the rest of this hour. Uh, Georgia Gilholly and Jason Reed um, will be back uh, with some more of the issues affecting your generation after the very latest news and the sport. 
Uh, well, that was um, quite an inspirational story there. Um, let me just uh, bring in my youth panel, Georgia Gilholly and Jason Reed. Um, Georgia, I mean, uh, Galal isn't one of the younger winners at Tokyo, but we've seen some extraordinary performances from teenagers. I mean, like the skateboarder Sky Brown, 13 years old, uh, Britain's youngest ever Olympic medalist. Yeah, it's really incredible. And um, yeah, I think um, your previous guest just um, really spoke um, to the power of, I guess, sport. I'm speaking as someone who's certainly not an expert or, you know, an amazing uh, person at sports at all. But I think it's really great for um, young people and adults, of course, to be getting active. I think that sport um, even though, you know, myself, I hated like PE at school. Um, <laughs> it definitely installs discipline and a sense of fair play and it's okay to lose. It's great to win when you've worked for it. Uh, I think we've sort of losing that because most of us are just sort of stuck, um, you know, in front of our laptops, especially for the past year. Um, so it's really great to see that. And I think just, you know, things like the Olympics, they often sort of bring together people together and people get excited. It's something you can watch together and support um, your country or whatever team you prefer. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, um, what, what about you? Have you been have you been at all inspired by the Olympics? I have, yeah. The same as Georgia. I wasn't really, you know, I'm not a sports person by any stretch of the imagination, but um, I think the inspiration of the Olympics goes goes way beyond sport. It makes you feel, it makes you feel patriotic for one thing. Great Britain are, are fifth currently in the medal tables, beaten only by China, the US, Japan and Russia, which is quite an achievement in itself. Um, and, you know, seeing after the year and a half that we've had, seeing all these people doing such amazing things and competing in sports, which certainly I'd, I'd never watched before, the competitive climbing, the uh, the, the Madison, which is a, a cycling relay event, which is absolutely fantastic to watch. Um, these people absolutely are the peak of their physical ability, representing their nation on the world stage. And we're seeing these big events happen. Um, it's just very encouraging and it's, it's very inspiring. It makes us feel that life can go back to normal again and we can realise our dreams again, if that's not too much of a cliche. Yeah, and Georgia, one of the things we were reflecting on um, earlier in the programme with Rebecca Myers was pointing out that quite a few of the medals that Team GB have picked up are in the sort of sports where people do have a reasonable chance of at least getting involved. They're not obviously all going to become Olympic champions, but lots of people get out on their skateboards in any case or might have an opportunity to get on the, the BMX. Um, those sorts of sports are more widely accessible to people than perhaps the equestrian events or the sailing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think from what I know about the history of the Olympics, mostly from Tom Holland's podcast uh, recently, <laughs> I believe that those were quite recent additions to um, the modern Olympics, of course, the Olympics being an ancient uh, practice. Um, and I think, yeah, having those kind of events is probably good because, you know, not everyone can obviously be, you know, a world-class sprinter or swimmer, but things like skateboarding and BMX, yeah, possibly um, it's more about your enthusiasm and sort of concentration rather than, you know, being the kind of person who has the I guess is born sort of obviously you know it takes a lot of work but there are people who are born for example with the kind of you know genetics that make them more predisposed for certain sports for example I'm very sure I'm never going to be a sprinter it's not going to happen um, <laughs> but maybe if I was interested in BMX or skateboarding maybe being in the Olympics would be accessible to me and yeah it's probably um, it's good that those kind of things are also involved um, because they involve skill and concentration but they're not necessarily as inaccessible as other forms of sport. Georgia Gilholly, Jason Reed, I know you're going to stay with us throughout this hour here on Times Radio. Um... This is Times Radio. And with me, my youth panel, Georgia Gilholly and Jason Reed. Now, this week, the government launched a new campaign to try to persuade more young people to get vaccinated. Um, Jason, have you had your jabs yet? I've had my first one. I've got the second one next week. So I signed up as soon as I was able to. And 
were you keen to get vaccinated? Were most of your contemporaries uh, racing to try to get their jab appointments booked? Or was there much hesitation amongst some of your friends? Um, well, I think I know people with a with a range of perspectives on the issue. Personally, I was, I was very enthusiastic. It seems to me that um, there's very little cost to getting vaccinated. It's, uh, it's very quick. It's free. It's very easy. Um, and the benefits, of course, are enormous because it means that we can return to life as normal and I can walk around safely and I know that I'm safe and I know that I'm keeping everyone else around me as safe as I possibly can. Um, so, yeah, I was, I was very keen to get vaccinated and uh, I think that everyone should. Unfortunately, it seems that not everyone shares that perspective and vaccine uptake among people my age has been, uh, has been much lower than for people in the rest of the, the population, which I don't think is down to any kind of uh, 5G conspiracy nonsense or anything like that. It, it's just that it's just a kind of hesitancy and a convenience issue. And so it seems to me that a campaign to uh, nudge more people, to encourage more people to get vaccinated, um, especially younger people, is uh, definitely a good thing. Um, Georgia, I, I mean, do you agree with that? Have you had your jab? Um, so I've had the first one and I've now been offered the second one. Um, I agree that for most people, there's no minus to getting jabbed. But I am quite aware that there seems to be a bit of a, I don't know, possibly sort of a creepiness in people who seem to be kind of like obsessed with everyone getting vaccinated. I think that for most young people, most people are ha most young people are happy to get vaccinated. But I don't think it's surprising that there would be less of us being vaccinated because the disease itself is it's very unlikely to have an adverse impact on us and the people who you know would be vulnerable to the more adverse impacts of it have obviously made the decision to be vaccinated in the vast majority of cases so i'm not necessarily adverse to encouraging people to get the vaccine i don't think that there's necessarily a negative unless you, of course you have an allergy or something like that to getting it um but i think you know is it really is it worth taxpayers money to pay for i don't know adverts to try and get 16 year olds to get the vaccine i just don't think it's necessary yeah i mean because uh, the vaccination program is being extended to 16 and 17 year olds do you think that's a good idea georgia yeah i mean i mean of course um the disease isn't as dangerous to young people, as I've said already, but it doesn't necessarily mean that young people shouldn't be vaccinated. So it should certainly be an option. Um, I've heard, I've heard um, actually some arguments from, I guess, I believe I read it in The Guardian, actually, um, that we should donate all of our vaccines for younger people to developing countries who are struggling to get their hands on, you know, verified vaccines or effective vaccines. Um, and I think that actually possibly that could make sense in some circumstances because does it not make sense to say how uh, you know help a developing country that's struggling with um older people who are uh, more vulnerable people who don't have access to effective vaccines or vaccinating a bunch of 16 year olds in the uk who are really not at risk from the adverse effects or the virus and jason there is this point really that a lot of the thinking behind getting 16 and 17 year olds vaccinated is, yes, because it's going to provide them with greater protection from getting seriously ill, but also because of the concerns about them spreading the infections. Yeah, absolutely. There's no disagreement within the science on this at all, that getting vaccinated is, unless you have a particular medical exemption, of course, getting vaccinated is always better than not being vaccinated, both for yourself and for everyone else around you. Um, and we have heard over the last year and a half or so the occasional tragic case of even very young children, younger than 16, um, who have died as a result of coronavirus. And it just seems to me that it's, it's common sense to have everybody uh, take this life-saving injection that we've managed to develop and test in, uh, in record time. It seems like a no-brainer to me. And it's, I think uh, as we go forward in the coming months and years, our only regret uh, will be that we didn't do this sooner. I don't know why it took so long to open up vaccinations to 16 and 17 year olds, because the alternative, which seems absurd, is denying 16 and 17 year olds who really want the vaccine the ability to get it. 
of course, the government's going beyond its advertising campaign. It has said that in the autumn, uh, evidence of vaccination is likely to be a requirement of getting into nightclubs and some other big events as well. Georgia, what's your take on that idea? Um, yeah, I completely disagree with having those kind of regulations. I think that it's people's uh, choice to go in public spaces and they can choose to have the vaccine, they can choose to not have the vaccine. And if you've chose to have the vaccine and you are aware that it is very effective, why would you be against or why would you be in favour of having to know that every single person in a certain restaurant or pub or wherever has had the vaccine or has tested? I believe there'll be alternatives, you know, for people who haven't taken the vaccine. I think they will have to produce a positive test. I think, though, it also depends on the location. Um, I think it's just completely unnecessary. I think that if you're a person who is worried about getting the virus and how that might impact your health, you can take your own precautions. And I don't think, while I do believe that it's, you know, up to private businesses to make their own decisions, I think that it is unnecessary for the government to basically force businesses into doing this. Of course, what the government would say is that nightclubs, because they're inside, because there's obviously not much social distancing goes on, that those sorts of venues, some other events, um, are likely to be locations where the virus could could spread. And if we want to get the infections down, then we require everyone to, to get a COVID passport. True, but that's the case for, you know, every other sort of disease that spreads in that way. And also, as I said, it's up to the individual if you are truly worried that getting the infection is going to be bad for you, which would probably suggest that you haven't got the vaccine or you are, I don't know, old, vulnerable, not necessarily, not necessarily about to jump into a nightclub. I think that that's as much as you can do. And would we, for example, want vaccine passports in locations like supermarkets, shops, um, which are also sort of crowded spaces? Um, I just, I really think that it's sort of creating, uh, you know, a two-tier society when we don't really need one. You know, if you want the vaccine, it's open to you, unless you are very, very young because it's been open to you know teenagers and stuff. Um, I think it's, I think it's unnecessary. Jason, um, what's your view on this idea of COVID passports for nightclubs? I think there's a there's a tension in. Uh in the position of people who oppose the COVID passports for nightclubs, because on the one hand, we hear a lot quite rightly about the sacrifices that young people have made over the last year and a half, even when the vaccine disproportionately doesn't affect us, uh, sorry, the virus doesn't affect us in the same way. Um, and on the other hand, when there's a very simple uh, um, policy like this that comes along, which would allow us to uh, return everything to normal, then we're opposing it. It doesn't make a huge amount of sense to me. So far in this pandemic, there have been trade-offs um, because we could always open up more but then we put more people in danger of contracting the virus and on the other hand we could keep everything completely locked down and keep everyone safe but of course um, that has huge detrimental effects through the effects of lockdown both economically and socially. Vaccine passports are the silver bullets. They allow us to um, have the best of both worlds because we can reopen everything and restore everyone's freedoms and everyone can do everything they want to do and at the same time we're keeping everyone as safe uh, and as healthy as they possibly can. Of course, we want to edge towards a position where vaccine passports aren't necessary, where we've gone past the need for them. And it seems we are kind of very slowly creeping in that direction. There was uh, a nightclub owner who was talking recently about how they've installed a new ventilation system, which allows them to change all of the air in the nightclub every 15 minutes, which is quite extraordinary, extraordinary and will go a huge way towards uh, stopping transmission. But in the interim, as a kind of temporary measure, it seems that seems to me to make sense to only allow people who have done the very simple thing that it's in their power to do to, uh, to help stop this pandemic to enter places like nightclubs, where, of course, there is inevitably a lot of physical activity and a lot of people breathing the same air. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, a lot of businesses have uh, gone to extraordinary lengths to try and adapt their businesses and have done amazingly well with that. Um, Georgia, Jason says they're a, a silver bullet, these COVID passports. I mean, do you fear they're a form of ID by the back door? I mean, they quite literally are. Um, I don't think you could argue with that. I guess it's just certain people would say that it's a worthy trade-off. 
I simply don't think looking at the impact that the virus has on people who are vaccinated, and as I've just said, most people now can choose to get vaccinated, and that's been the case for a while, it makes no sense to install that when there is a very low risk of, you know, disaster occurring. And also, Jason, you said that we're entering a situation where they will become unnecessary. But I don't think we could say that for definite because, one, it's setting a precedent. And two, you know, COVID isn't the only disease. Um, so could we see this happen for for other diseases, much less dangerous diseases? It seems we're edging towards some sort of proto-biosecurity state where we're just handing over little by little ever more control to the government and just completely disregarding personal responsibility and personal freedoms. I just don't think that installing that kind of system is a necessary, you know, a necessary uh, response to the low risk. Okay. Um, let's just quickly touch on one other issue. Jason, you talked about um, the sacrifices that a lot of young people have made. I know you were saying that you've just graduated. Of course, it's now hugely difficult, isn't it, for young people trying to move into the world of work. Um, a, a lot of temporary jobs have been uh, suspended uh, while while hospitality was closed. Most of those are back online now. But for people trying to get some proper work experience to get a foot in the door, that's still very difficult, isn't it? It's extremely difficult. Yeah, it's uh, this, this pandemic is, is a once in a lifetime event, which has changed absolutely every aspect of the fabric of our society in, in ways that we could we could never have foreseen and um, I think it's it's disproportionately hitting young people still even now we're at such a late stage in the vaccination program because as you say it's so difficult to to find those jobs the the labor market for those graduate jobs and for those um, those kinds of work experience and low-level jobs have been it's been squeezed to within an inch of its life and it, it leaves a lot of people, out in the cold because there's not a huge amount that powerless uh, powerless young people can really do about that. Um, Georgia, just time for a quick thought from you on that. Absolutely. I would just pick up on Jason's point. It's really an unfortunate situation. I think for some people, possibly, it could make things a little bit easier. You know, they don't have to live in London, for example, where I believe Jason and myself both live and we know how expensive it can be, for example. But on the same note, being a young person you want to be in a physical workplace you want to meet people you want to bounce off each other's ideas that kind of thing you're not getting the same experience and the same i guess baptism of fire into the world of work that you would have in an in-person environment and in terms of work experience that's obviously what people are trying to get when they're younger and less experienced so the impact is even more adverse and be interesting to see if these kind of practices stay on. I know that certain okay. big corporations are trying to make people come into the office now. We have to leave it there. Georgia Gilholly, Jason Reed, thank you both so much for being on my youth panel this afternoon here on Times Radio.